Shepsut's story begins here at the Temple of Deir el-Bahri, across the river from Thebes, the ancient religious capital of Egypt. 170 years ago, a young Frenchman, Champollion, walked down this corridor. Having cracked the hieroglyphic code, he became the first man in 2,000 years to read Hatshepsut's name, as Egyptologist Dr. Bob Breyer explains. When Champollion came here, he uncovered a mystery. There were two kings on the wall. Now, one of the kings he knew, Tutmosis III, he had seen his name up and down the Nile and knew he was a great king. But the second one, he had never heard of, King Hatshepsut. Now, the thing that puzzled Champollion was that wherever there were two kings together, Hatshepsut was always taking the place of honor in front of the other king. Then things got really weird. This is his journal. This is Champollion's journal. And over here, he recorded the inscriptions, the cartouches, the names. And he noted that wherever there was the bearded pharaoh, the verbs and nouns were in the feminine. There's Hatshepsut. She's wearing the beard of the pharaoh. And that's no miniskirt. That's the kilt of the king of Egypt. It was all confusing, and Champollion never figured it out. It took Egyptologists another hundred years to do that. Hatshepsut, the queen of Egypt, had decided to wear men's clothing and declare herself pharaoh. Hatshepsut's father was buried in a tomb that had been cut into the mountain. This is where the treasures of Tutankhamun were discovered and where Ramses the Great was laid to rest. All because of Hatshepsut's father, the pharaoh Tutmosis I. A thousand years before Hatshepsut was born, the pharaohs were buried in pyramids in the desert. But by the time Hatshepsut's father was king, all the pyramids had been robbed. Egypt had suffered long periods of turmoil and instability and was just beginning to return to order. Hatshepsut's father needed a place where he and his treasures could be buried safely. Tutmosis decided on a secret burial in a remote, barren valley. An inhospitable place where no one would ever want to live. A site that would later become known to the world as the Valley of the Kings. It was a bold venture, but not beneath the capabilities of Hatshepsut's father. The tomb was completed, and Tutmosis became the first pharaoh of Egypt to be buried in the Valley of the Kings. Moses was a fearless military commander. As soon as he became pharaoh, he led an expedition south into Nubia, now the Sudan, to quell a rebellion. He had to pass four dangerous cataracts, each of which could smash a ship to pieces. led his troops deeper into Nubia than any pharaoh had ever done before to defeat a confederation of Nubian tribes. Hatshepsut's father was a formidable opponent. Tutmosis and his queen had five children, but Hatshepsut was the only one to survive her parents. It was in Hatshepsut's veins alone that pure royal blood flowed. But could a woman become king of Egypt? In Egyptian times, choosing a king was complicated. Often embroiled in intrigue and power struggles, it took place in secret, 
behind palace walls. As Bob Breyer explains. This is a royal palace. It's a maze of tiny rooms. You see, the king had several wives, so he wanted plenty of space. Here's a throne room. It's where the king would have held audiences. It's amazingly small, isn't it? But the walls were mostly mud brick, so they couldn't hold up a really big ceiling. But wait till you see the bathroom. It's practically camping out, but it was state-of-the-art for ancient Egypt. See this wall? It's stone. It's a luxury. If you took too many baths in a mud brick bathroom, you wouldn't have any walls left. There's no word in ancient Egyptian for queen. What the hieroglyphs really say is king's great wife. There was only one king's great wife at any one time, but beneath her were minor wives, and beneath them, concubines. And all of them hoped that one day their sons would be king of Egypt. Hatshepsut was a royal kid. She would have grown up in a palace like this. Lots of women, lots of children, lots of rooms, lots of intrigue. She was undoubtedly bright, and she should have succeeded her father as king if she were a boy. But the king's great wife didn't have any sons that lived. So the line of succession wasn't clear. This was the kind of time when the son of a minor wife could become pharaoh of Egypt. When Hatshepsut was 12, her father died. The young girl was the only true royal heir. But Egypt needed a king, so Hatshepsut was married to Tutmosis, her half-brother, who had been named after his father. Tutmosis II was the son of a minor wife, half royal, so he needed Hatshepsut if he were ever to rule as king. When they married, Tutmosis II was in his twenties, and Hatshepsut, a 12-year-old girl, became queen of Egypt. Tutmosis II was hardly an outstanding pharaoh. His mummy suggests he was a far cry from the kind of man an Egyptian woman would have dreamt of. He was an unhealthy, frail man with little musculature. He was in his forties when he died. Bald, his body dotted with scabs. He built no great monuments, raised no obelisks to the heavens, and conquered no foreign lands. He never accompanied his army on campaigns. It could be said he was the exact opposite of Hatshepsut's father. The best that can be said of his reign is that it was uneventful. This must have been difficult for her, raised in a palace where great deeds and bold innovations were the norm. She and Tutmosis had only one child, a daughter, Neferure. By the time Tutmosis died, they were in their 20th year of marriage. Hatshepsut was now 32 years old and she was free. The mother of a young daughter, queen of Egypt and in the prime of life. Now she would show Egypt what the daughter of a great king could do. She began the most incredible building program any queen had ever undertaken. Deir el-Bahri was Hatshepsut's mortuary temple, where she could be worshipped after her death. A building like this was unprecedented. Egypt must have been stunned. Nestling in the mountains, its clear, straight lines allow it to stand out against the rugged background. Arguably, it's one of the most beautiful temples ever built in ancient Egypt. In the previous century, Egypt's pharaohs have been preoccupied with war, fending off their enemies. This was the first major building project since the turmoil ceased. A beautiful work of art, it must also have made a strong political statement. Divine order will be restored. The Queen of Egypt is capable of great things. It was to mark the beginning of a new life for Hatshepsut. For 20 years, she had been the dutiful, silent wife of Tutmosis II. Now, 
the energy she had inherited from her father was going to be expressed. Dear El Bahri was the result. Once again, royal workshops began producing official sculptures of the ruler of Egypt. But Hatshepsut's portraits were different from those of her male predecessors. She was shown as slender, with an aquiline nose and full cheeks. A young woman, fresh and vibrant. For the next thousand years, her statues would set the standard. But it was to be her obelisks, undoubtedly among the greatest achievements of the ancient world, that would surpass even them in their magnificence. Shepsut was especially proud of the magnificent obelisks she erected at Karnak Temple. Here, lying still unfinished in the quarry, is an example of an obelisk. Still attached to the granite from which it was carved, it shows its huge scale. Every Egyptian obelisk was cut from the same granite quarries in Aswan, located around 250 kilometers south of Thebes. Granite was the only stone strong enough for such a tall monument. Its construction was an incredible feat. You can still see the channels where workers pounded for months to free it from the surrounding rock. Achepsut's two obelisks were completed in just seven months. She recorded their transportation to Karnak on the walls of her temple at Deir el Bari. The obelisks were dragged on sleds to the riverbank and placed on one barge end to end. It must have made an extraordinary sight. Once at Karnak, the obelisks over 30 meters high and weighing 350 tons had to be erected. There's no written record of how the Egyptians raised obelisks. The current theory is that they were lowered down a ramp onto a large granite base. The obelisk caught on a groove on the base and was then pulled upright by a series of ropes. And there is nothing holding an obelisk upright. It relies on its own perfect balance to remain on its base and stands as testament to the precision of Egyptian craftsmen. On the base of her obelisks, Hatshepsut wrote these words. She made them as her monument for her father Amun, Lord of Thebes, presiding over Karnak, making for him two great obelisks of enduring granite of the south. Their summits of Electrum, the best of any country, are seen on both sides of the river. Hatshepsut had every right to be proud. Her ultimate obelisk is the unfinished one in the quarry at Aswan. It weighs nearly a thousand tons, three times the weight of the other obelisks. She was confident that it could be quarried, moved and erected. But it cracked while the workmen were pounding it free from the rock and had to be abandoned. It was not Hatshepsut's technology that failed, but the granite itself. To achieve great things, she needed the talent of outstanding people, and Hatshepsut was to rely on one such man, Senmut. She elevated Senmut, her daughter's tutor, to the position of overseer of the works. Hatshepsut knew him well. She even entrusted her only child to him. Senmut's good service to Hatshepsut was well rewarded. He was born a commoner, but rose to one of the highest offices in the land. Under the patronage of Hatshepsut, he was able to build a shrine at Gebel Silsila, 60 kilometers north of Aswan. This has always been a special place. Gebel Silsila means mountain of the chain, and legend has it that in medieval times, the Egyptians placed a chain around one of the huge rocks on the riverbank and stretched it across the Nile to stop ships from passing. 
The nobility had private chapels carved along the banks of the Nile to gain favor with Sobek, the crocodile god. This was where the rich and illustrious of ancient Egypt came to flaunt their wealth. Here, among the elite of Egypt, Senmut built his chapel. But you have to look very hard to find it. It's not visible from the riverbank. Tucked away in the rock cliffs, its view of the Nile is superb. Though not much remains of the inscriptions, there is just enough of his titles to identify the name Senmut. As Egypt prospered under Hatshepsut's reign, there was a cloud appearing on the horizon. Her late husband had had a son by a minor wife. Tutmosis III, her stepson, named after his father, was heir to the throne. When he was young, it was only natural for Hatshepsut to rule in his place as regent. But now he was growing up. Tradition required that Egypt should have a king. Hatshepsut's power was about to slip away, as Bob Breyer explains. Think about what must have been going on inside of Hatshepsut's head. For 20 years, she endured a marriage where she was merely the king's wife. Now, for seven glorious years, she ruled alone, doing great things. She must have loved it. I can't imagine her ever willing to give up the throne. But there was a problem. If Tutmosis assumed the duties of king, his wife would become queen of Egypt, and Hatshepsut wouldn't be top banana. But what could she do? What Hatshepsut did next was unprecedented in the whole of Egyptian history. Egypt was at last to get its pharaoh, King Hatshepsut. Until now, she had kept the title of King's great wife. But to keep her power, Hatshepsut took the title King. This prevented her stepson Tutmosis from assuming the throne. She was now shown wearing a false beard and pharaoh's garments. But how could she get away with it? The answer was that she was clearly an excellent ruler, and Egypt was content. A court official said of her, The divine consort, Hatshepsut, settles the affairs of the two lands by her plans. Egypt was made to labor with bowed head for her, the excellent seed of the god. Hatshepsut had to play the part of a male to continue running the country. But she wasn't pretending to be a man. Though she wore the false beard and kilt of a pharaoh required for ceremonies of state, she did not attempt to hide the fact that she was a woman. Even her name, Hatshepsut, means foremost of the noble women. She was a successful ruler, and Egypt's newfound prosperity was her achievement. Would her stepson, the heir to the throne, accept this? All indications show that the teenage boy was more than happy. He was probably where he wanted to be, on expeditions, traveling with the army. And if her stepson, Tutmosis, was in the army, he was probably training in Syria. Throughout history, Syria has been a battleground because of its strategic location. The Hittites in the north, where modern Turkey is today, had always fought Egypt for control of Syria. Egypt periodically sent military expeditions here to enforce their presence, and Tutmosis was no doubt part of that force. Centuries after the Egyptians, Roman armies fought for control of Syria and the trade routes. Much later, in the Middle Ages, the Crusaders built huge forts in Syria when they fought for the Holy Land. The military was a perfect place for a pharaoh in training. Thousands of soldiers had to be fed, paid, controlled, inspired. An ancient army wasn't just a fighting force, it was a huge bureaucracy that had to be administered. Someone had to oversee the stables, the weapons, the chariots, and deal with potential problems of successfully transporting and storing food for thousands of men. Tutmosis would have witnessed all of this. If you could run an army, you could certainly run a country. As Tutmosis would later show, he was content where he was. This too suited Hatshepsut, 
Back in Egypt, she was the undisputed ruler. If Hatshepsut had been a good queen, she was unsurpassed as king. One year after becoming pharaoh, she sent a trading expedition to the distant land of Punt. This was a bold and dangerous venture that took tremendous organization. No pharaoh had sent a trading expedition to Punt for centuries. The expedition marched from a base near Thebes for 150 kilometers on a desert road through an area known as the Wadi Hammamut. Supplies for the trip had to be transported by donkeys and each night the expedition camped by wells to refill their water skins. When they finally reached the port of Kusair on the Red Sea, supplies were loaded onto five ships for the 900 kilometer journey south. The Egyptian sailors were used to the Nile where they could always see land. So on their Red Sea voyage, they sailed within sight of the coast. Hunt was located in the Sudan, on the border of Ethiopia. Hatshepsut recorded the great adventure on the walls of her temple. When the ships arrived, they were greeted by the Queen of Punt, shown as an obese woman. The Puntians lived in thatched roofed houses on stilts, and because the Egyptians had not traded there for centuries, they were unlike anything they had seen before. This was the first depiction of tribal African life in history. The transaction seemed to have gone well. The ships were loaded with incense and frankincense and myrrh trees, with their roots carefully wrapped and protected in baskets. Only a prosperous, well-governed country could attempt an expedition of this magnitude. This was indeed Hatshepsut's Egypt. As her reign of prosperity continued, no one benefited more than Senmut. He had already been promoted to overseer of the royal works, but around the time Hatshepsut became king, Senmut was permitted to begin constructing his own tomb, high on a hill, with a fine view of the plain and river below. It was vast, befitting a man favoured by the king. On the walls, Senmut recorded his titles. He was in charge of the palace, but he was also overseer of the granaries of the god Amun, overseer of the house of Amun, and overseer of the officials, which basically meant he was in charge of everything. The tomb is badly damaged, but there are glimpses of its former glory. Inside the tomb are caves, and Senmut may have intended to use one for his burial. One clue as to how important Senmut was to Hatshepsut can be found in the broken pieces of his sarcophagus, found by excavators in his tomb. Like forensic detectives, they pieced it back together and were surprised at their discovery. Hatshepsut had given him her own sarcophagus to be buried in. The sarcophagus was in the shape of a cartouche, the oval encircling a royal name. The inscriptions, once for a royal female, had been altered and spelled out the title Overseer of the Granaries of Amun, Senmut. No commoner had ever been buried in a royal sarcophagus. Senmut must have been a very special person. The sarcophagus was probably carved for Hatshepsut when she was still queen. But when she became king, she needed a new one to reflect her position as pharaoh. So she gave her queen's sarcophagus to Senmut, 
so he could rest in it for eternity in his stunning tomb. Given Senmut's privileged position in Hatshepsut's court, the sarcophagus, all his titles, the shrine at Gebel Silsila, and his vast tomb with its beautiful view, many have suggested that Senmut and Hatshepsut were lovers. This might explain why Senmut remained a bachelor all his life, which was very unusual in ancient Egypt. If they were lovers, it would have to have been kept secret. He was a commoner, and she the ruler of Egypt. But is there any evidence to prove that they were lovers? The workmen building the temple at Deir el-Bari have left a clue as to the nature of the relationship between Hatshepsut and her favorite Senmut. As the men worked in the heat of the day, they would rest in the shade of the unfinished tombs that dotted the hills. While they ate their lunch, they would frequently sketch on the walls. One of the workmen seems to have made his boss, Senmut, the subject of this graffiti. He has drawn a figure wearing the overseer's cap making love to a female, wearing what seems to be a pharaoh's headdress. The workmen weren't alone in their suspicions. More than one Egyptologist has suggested that Hatshepsut and Senmut were lovers. The workmen at Deir al-Bahi had especially good reason to suspect this love affair. On Hatshepsut's temple, Senmut appears dozens of times, usually shown worshipping Hatshepsut. No commoner ever appears so many times on a temple wall. Senmut and Hatshepsut's relationship must have been a close one. Hatshepsut's image has suffered at the hands of early Egyptologists, men who felt a woman couldn't possibly achieve such great things alone. Herbert Winlock, who excavated Deir el-Bahri in the 1920s, believed that Senmut was the power behind the throne, directing the course of Hatshepsut's reign. Wenlock certainly was not endeared towards him. He said, Senmut must have been a conniver, if not an actual instigator, for it's difficult to see how any such course could have been successful without the assistance of the high steward. But Wenlock was wrong. Senmut needed Hatshepsut, ruler of Egypt, to further his career. She didn't need him. But it's prejudice like this that led Egyptologists to view her as a passive figure. But her chepsut was no shrinking violet arranging the palace furniture. There's even a report that she led her troops in battle. Come on. The evidence can be found on Sahel Islands, south of Aswan. Bob Breyer has taken the ferry to this remote site that is rarely visited today. Insurance company. Insurance? Really? Again, yes, on July. Here, there's at least one eyewitness to Hatshepsut's military exploits. One of her treasurers went on a military campaign to Nubia, probably to keep track of spending and the wealth they brought back. On his return, he stopped on the island. Sahel was the bulletin board of Egypt, where announcements were carved on rocks for all to see. There they would remain for thousands of years. T, the treasurer, was so impressed with what he saw of Hatshepsut in Nubia that he inscribed an account of it on a rock.
Though Dr. Breyer hasn't yet seen the actual inscription, the great Egyptian Egyptologist Labib Habishi wrote about it. In the hundreds of inscriptions all over the island, would he be able to find it? It's not what I'm looking for, but it's pretty good. It's a Hatshepsut inscription. It's carved by a man named Amenhotep. There's his name. And he was Hatshepsut's overseer of the works here. And what he was really proud of is that he quarried two of his queen's obelisks. There's the word for obelisk, Tehenu. Now, he had a problem, though. Hatshepsut was king, but she was a female. So poor Amenhotep wasn't sure how to refer to her. So over here he says that he was beloved of him. He wanted to be politically correct, but he just didn't know what to do. Bob spent many hours among the rocks searching in vain. He wasn't able to find what he was looking for amongst the hundreds of inscriptions here at Sahel. But it's not this particular inscription's location that's important, but what it tells us. Carved by the treasurer T, whose job it was to keep track of the spoils the army took from Nubia, it says that Hatshepsut was with the army in Nubia and that she defeated the Nubians. T actually saw Nubian chiefs that had been captured and brought before Hatshepsut. It proves she was no pacifist. Hatshepsut was king of Egypt. Her power was absolute. Towards the end of her reign, Hatshepsut bestowed yet another honor on Senmut. He was permitted to build an even grander tomb, right next to her temple at Deir el-Bahri. It was extraordinary for a commoner to have a burial within the precincts of a royal temple. But as we've seen, Senmut was no ordinary man. tomb has some interesting features. Amongst them, Egyptologist Bob Breyer's favorite is the portrait of Senmut complete with wrinkled cheeks. This is the first astronomical ceiling in history. They've even got the constellations. After Senmut, pharaohs in the Valley of the Kings would copy this. It's really neat. Senmut wanted to be buried here. He covered the walls with spells from the Book of the Dead. And then he had a request. O oh, you who are among the land of the living, be you scribe or priest, say the magical spells for Senmut, the steward of Amun. There may have been a special reason why Hatshepsut permitted Senmut to build his tomb so close to her temple. Senmut's tomb tunnels straight towards the Valley of the Kings, just a few hundred meters away and that's precisely where Hatshepsut's tomb lies. Unable to express their love openly in life, they may have intended to spend eternity together. And they may have achieved it. Senmut died before Hatshepsut. Just a few years later, she joined him in the next world. Her tomb on the other side of the mountains is one of the most unusual in the Valley of the Kings, as Bob Breyer has discovered. This is 
is Hatshepsut's tomb. There's a lot of history here, ancient and modern. It was discovered in 1903 by Howard Carter, about 20 years before he found Tutankhamun's tomb. But when Carter found it, this tomb was full of rubble, washed in by the occasional rainstorm that hits the Valley of the Kings. It was as hard as cement, and his workmen had to chip it out with pickaxes. It was one of the most difficult excavations in the history of the valley. After two months of clearing, Carter had to stop work. The air in the tomb was so bad and so hot that the workmen couldn't keep their candles alight. Eventually, they brought in electric lights, a new technology for the time. As they struggled to clear the passage, it seemed it would never end. It was, in fact, the longest and deepest tomb in the Valley of the Kings. In the early days of construction, Hatshepsut's workmen had hit bad rock that wasn't suitable for carving wall decorations. So they kept going, descending, twisting and turning in search of fine limestone. But they never found it. As Bob Breyer descends to find the burial chamber, he was halted by the same thing that stopped Howard Carter. Recent rains had washed rubble into the tomb and blocked the burial chamber. Carter did finally reach the burial chamber, where he found two beautiful red quartzite sarcophagi. One inscribed for Hatshepsut and one for her father. She had opened her father's tomb and had had his mummy removed to her tomb for reburial. In death, as in life, Hatshepsut wanted strong men close to her. After Hatshepsut's death, her stepson, Tutmosis III, at last became pharaoh. All his years of training in the army served him well. He was the greatest military hero in Egypt's history. During his 33 years as king, he led 17 military campaigns personally. Palestine and Syria were subdued, and Tutmosis pushed far to the north, crossing the Euphrates into modern-day Iraq. The new king was able to achieve these military successes because Hatshepsut had maintained the army. He inherited a prosperous, well-governed country. He could have sat back and begun to construct great monuments to his glory. But Tutmosis III was not interested in building. He seems to have been most comfortable leading his army, and this may well explain his relationship with Hatshepsut. While she was ruling as king, he was satisfied to lead the life of a military man. The remains of a red stone chapel built by Hatshepsut at Karnak Temple suggests this was a mutually beneficial relationship. The dismantled blocks, awaiting reassembly by French Egyptologists, bear the names of both Hatshepsut and Tutmosis. And they're shown side by side as co-rulers. They certainly weren't competitors. But after Tutmosis had reigned for 20 years, there seems to have been a change of heart, and Hatshepsut's red chapel was dismantled. Her name was erased on all her monuments and was replaced with the name of her father, her husband or her successor. History was being rewritten. It was as if Hatshepsut had never existed. Egypt had decided it could not have had a woman as king. 
It was not the traditional way. It upset the divine order. But history has a way of evening the score. In the 1870s, one of the greatest archaeological finds of all time was uncovered. More than a dozen royal mummies were found in a single tomb. In ancient times, the Valley of the Kings had become unsafe, and the mummies of the kings and queens of Egypt were gathered and buried in a cache. Discovered by Egyptian authorities, the mummies were hastily moved to the museum in Cairo. Among the dozens of great Egyptians in the cache were the mummies of Tutmosis I, the second, the third, and Ramses the Great. Several of the mummies were unidentified. Could two of them have been Hatshepsut and Senmut? Among the objects found with the mummies is a box bearing the cartouche of Hatshepsut. Inside is her liver, removed by the embalmers during mummification. Since her liver is present, it's reasonable to conclude that one of the unidentified female mummies from the cache is Hatshepsut. There is also a possibility that one of the unidentified males is Senmut. We know what he looked like. Ancient artists have left sketches of him all with a slight double chin, a sign of prosperity. But they also show distinct lines on the cheeks, which is unusual. Winlock, the American excavator who found the sketches of Senmut, said, as for the wrinkles, they were surely the feature by which he was known. One of the mummies found in the communal tomb was described by the anatomist who first examined it as probably a high official, well advanced in years. Could it be Senmut? Known as Unknown Man C, the distinguishing feature of this mummy is the deep wrinkles on his cheeks. Despite the tomb robberies and the long ago moving of mummies, Hatshepsut and Senmut may at last have found peace. They may now rest in the same storage room in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, closer to each other than they had ever hoped. Hatshepsut's 22-year reign was a great success, even by Egyptian standards. She initiated bold trading expeditions, monumental building projects, and successful military campaigns. It was a time of great prosperity for Egypt. Yet Hatshepsut's name was eventually erased by the very man she groomed to follow her as Pharaoh of Egypt. Why, after 20 years, did Tutmosis III attempt to destroy the memory of Hatshepsut? It probably wasn't vengeance, as some have suggested. It had, in fact, to do with the notion of divine order in ancient Egypt. The concept of kingship that allowed pharaohs to be many things, warriors, builders, diplomats, administrators, could not permit it to be recorded that a woman had been king. The crime she seems to have committed, one that caused her name to be omitted from the lists of the kings of Egypt, seems simply to have been that she was a woman. But Hatshepsut is not that easily forgotten. Today, one of the most beautiful temples to be found in Egypt is Hatshepsut's temple at Deir el-Bahri. And the tallest obelisk in Egypt's history is Hatshepsut's obelisk, located at Karnak Temple. Almost as if she could foretell the future, Hatshepsut wrote, 
those who shall see my monuments in future years and shall speak of what I have done, beware of saying, it did not happen, nor say, it was a boast, but rather, how like her this is, how worthy of her father. One-fiftieth of a teaspoon of scorpion venom can kill a small child. We extract it in Discover Magazine, next.